Hello and welcome back to Sorting Algorithms with Dux. You're watching episode 8, Quick Sort. In the previous episode of this show, we covered recursion. Today, we're going to take a look at Quick Sort, which is a sorting algorithm that relies heavily on recursion. Now, unfortunately, I haven't found a very easy way to actually, you know, summarize the way Quick Sort works in a nutshell. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to jump right in and trace it. Hopefully, I can go slowly enough so that, you know, it's not too hard for you to understand. So here is our unsorted list. To perform Quick Sort, we need to keep track of three locations. I'm going to call this the left, the right, and the pivot. Now, similar to a number of sorting algorithms we've seen before, there are actually slight variations to Quick Sort. In particular, where you put the pivot doesn't actually matter. Some implementations of quick sort will actually place the pivot at a random item. We however are going to save that trouble and we're going to put it all the way to the left. And with regard to the left and right pointers, well, they're just going to go to the extreme left and right of the list. Do take note that this is not always the case. If I decide to tell quick sort to actually just work on a sub list, and this is something we will encounter later on by the way, the left and right pointers are going to go to the extremities of that sub list. Of course, when we first actually tell Quicksort to run, we just give it the entire list. Which is why for this first pass I'm tracing here, the left and right pointers go to the extremities of the entire unsorted list. So, the idea is this. The item at the left and right positions are compared. If they are out of place, and in this case because we're actually sorting in ascending order, so what we want is we want an item at the left to be smaller than an item at the right. If that is not the case, we're going to swap. In this case, 3 is larger than 2, everything is fine, so we can move on. Now, we have a left and a right pointer, so which one do we move? Now, the answer is we will move the right pointer. You don't have to worry so much about why that is so, I will come back to this and I will explain it again. So, we move the right pointer one position in. 2 and 5 is compared. No swap is necessary, so we move on. 2 and 8, once again, no swap is necessary. Now, we move on once again, and now the right pointer is actually pointing at 1. In this case, 1 and 2 needs to be swapped. Now, when we swap these two numbers, we must also pay attention to the pivot. You see, for each pass of quicksort, the pivot is always the same number. Which means, when a swap is made, the pivot must move as well. Since we started with the pivot on 2, now that 2 has moved its position, the pivot must also go to the new position where 2 is. However, the left and right pointers stay where they are, resulting in basically the pivot jumping from the left to the right pointer position. In case you're not clear, let me show you this entire step once again. Our right pointer moves from 8 to 1. 1 and 2 is swapped, and the pivot jumps from the left pointer to the right pointer. So, this is the unsorted list as it stands. We're going to continue moving on, but now instead of moving the right pointer, we're going to move the left pointer. Now, in this case, 2 is actually smaller than 7. However, because we've actually swapped the left and right pointers, the comparison in which we need to make is actually inverted. Of course, by inspection, you can tell that 7 and 2 is indeed out of place, and a swap needs to be made so that they are pairwise sorted. As always, remember to move the pivot. So once again, we move on, the right pointer moves to 4, no swap is required. It moves again to 6, once again, no swap is required. Now, notice what happens. It moves once more, and now left pointer, right pointer, and pivot are on the same item. This is actually our terminating condition. Once left and right pointers overlap, that's it, it's done. That pass has been complete. Now, let's take a look at what has actually happened here. As the left and right pointers move inwards, swaps are made. Eventually, the left and right pointers meet at the same point as the pivot. And now look at the entire list. Notice that 2 is actually put in its correct place. Now, when I say in its correct place, I do mean that in the final sorted list, this is exactly where 2 is going to sit. Now, this might not be extremely evident because we chose 2 to be the pivot for this first pass. However, Another characteristic of quicksort is that to the left of the pivot, 
all the items there actually have a value smaller than that of the pivot, whereas the items to its right will have a larger value. Now just a point to note here, if they are repeat items, it is acceptable to put it to the left or to the right, but it is recommended that you do it the same way every time. Now there's another point where I left hanging earlier on, it is of course the matter of which pointer is moving and what direction does it move in. You see, you notice that from time to time, as elements are being swapped, the pivot jumps from the left pointer to the right pointer and back. Here's the deal, whichever pointer, left or right, that has the pivot attached to it does not move. It is the other pointer that moves. With regard to the direction of movement, the pointer that is free to move always moves towards the other pointer. So I hope you can kind of see the pattern here. It's basically just the two pointers taking turns to move in towards each other. When they eventually meet, that's it. That pass of Quicksort is done. Quicksort of course doesn't stop here. You notice of course that Quicksort actually partitions the entire list. To the left of the pivot, there is an unsorted sublist as well as to the right. So of course what easier way to continue this than to recursively call Quicksort. In fact, at the end of a Quicksort pass, what basically happens is that Quicksort is run on the left sublist first, then the right sublist. What this means of course is that we are actually taking a divide and conquer approach to sorting this list. Each time the sublist gets smaller and smaller, and of course a one item sublist is inherently sorted, because of course left, right and pivot is all on the same item, so we don't have to worry about that. And that in fact is our base case for the recursion. Now there isn't much more for me to comment about this, so let us jump right into continuing the trace. So this is our unsorted sublist as it stands. We're going to call quick sort for the left sublist. Now the left sublist only contains one item, so we can consider it sorted. Since of course this is the base case, no more copies of quick sort will be called. We are then able to actually backtrack the recursive tree and jump in to actually sorting the right sublist of the original list. So now 6 is our pivot. Right off the bat, a swap is made. We move our left pointer onwards, and when it hits 7, a swap is made. The right pointer moves in once, and we hit 5. Once again, a swap is made. Finally, 6 and 8 is swapped. The left and right pointers are now pointing at the same position, meaning that 6 is in place. Once again, we carry on. We sort the left sublist now, which is 3, 4, and 5. Now, this is actually pretty simple. The right pointer just moves in towards the left, and 3 is put in place. There is nothing to the left of 3, so we jump on to sorting its right sublist, that is 4 and 5. Once again, the right pointer pops to the left, and 4 is put in place. 4 has no left sublist, so we jump straight to 5. Left, right, and pivot are all on the same item, meaning 5 is also in its correct position. 5 has no left or right sublist, so essentially its job is done. We backtrack on the recursion tree, and we realize that the next sublist we want to look at is the right sublist of 6. 7 and 8 is going to have to be swapped. This puts 8 in position. We then proceed to quick sort its left sublist. It's a one element sublist, so nothing needs to be done, 7 is in place. As we backtrack out of the recursion tree for the last time, we notice that there are basically no sublists left on the left or the right. This means that the pass of quicksort is done. We can backtrack all the way out of the recursion and call it a day. And there you have it, that is quicksort. With regard to time complexity, well, as you can tell, quicksort actually makes a minimal number of comparisons. In fact, the average case time complexity is n log n. It looks at n items, log n times. And of course, log n is smaller than n, Therefore, it is actually more efficient than an n-square time complexity. However, unfortunately, in the worst case, that is if you give quicksort an inversely sorted list, it is still going to have to take n-square time for quicksort to actually put it in place. And that wraps it up for this episode of Sorting Algorithms with Ducks. As always, if you have any comments, queries or suggestions, feel free to leave a comment in the comment section below. If you found this video helpful, I appreciate every like, favorite and subscription you give me. But once again, that is a wrap for this episode. You're watching Sir 612 TV.